Hi everyone, my name is Kara Feeney and I'm the Director of Exhibitions here at the Evanston Art Center. We're excited to have you all with us here today. Um, we are recording this um, and we will post it later on our website um, so you can review it and look at it later as well. Um, and now I'd like to introduce Paula Dana who would then introduce uh, the two curators and Fran Joy, one of our exhibition committee members as well. And then after that, we'll hear from the four exhibiting artists. Thank you. Welcome everyone. I'm Paula Danoff. I'm the president of the Evanston Arts Center and I'm so thrilled to see you all here today. The Evanston Arts Center is an artistic hub for over 90 years, believes that some communities are all too rarely represented in the curatorial world. To address this situation, the EAC has developed a recurrent project-based proposition for BIPOC curators to develop an exhibition of their choosing. It is the EAC's intent that such an exhibit will build both new ties to historically underrepresented groups, as well as introduce Evanston and the greater Chicago area to new curatorial and artistic perspectives. Our two co-curators for our inaugural curatorial fellowship are Alva Bruton and Adero Nutt. Formal training in art administration, art education, art gallery management, and studio art gave Alva Bruton the foundation as an art consultant. Her curatorial practice is the Phantom Gallery Chicago Network. The Phantom Galleries are temporary exhibitions in non-traditional gallery settings. She is a co-author and researcher for Pop-Up Research Station and Creative Conversation, a project that is a portal where curators nationally share knowledge and resources of best practices, ongoing professional development, and as a place for moral support to enhance our collective impact while staging pop-up exhibitions. Adaro Knott is an emerging curator who debuted at the MCA Chicago Curating Disability and Perspective, one of four exhibitions belonging to the Common Artist Project of Norman Teague and Faux Wilson's Black House Studios. Adaro is a prosthetic designer and founder of AK Prosthetics Corporation, an adaptive tech startup on a mission to make customized prosthetics and adaptive wearables accessible and inclusive. Adaro has been featured in Forbes, Chicago Sun-Times, and American Inno. For her innovative work, in the community of Chicago. Adaro is an ADA 25 Advancing Leadership Fellow of 2020. Fran Joy is also here today. She is a member of our, uh, the Evanston Arts Center Exhibitions Committee, an artist and a curator in her own right. So, thank you. Thank you, Paula. Uh, again, my name is Fran Joel. I am an artist, curator, and life coach in the area. I joined the exhibition committee a couple of years ago. And uh, first thing on the agenda was, um, I might have to take it off to speak, I'm sorry. Uh, first thing on the agenda was this fellowship. So um, what I like about the Evanston Art Center is they're not just talking about trying to be inclusive and diverse. They're actually walking the walk and not just talking the talk. And so the exhibition committee came up with a criteria that would meet this fellowship and all of its moving parts, uh, even though in the midst of COVID and uh, Adair Opian in Amsterdam, they pulled it off and here we are today. I had worked with Alpha before on another curated exhibit for Faces Not Forgotten, that was a traveling show. So I knew she had the experience and the talent and the organizational skills. And so I ran into her at the um, Museum of Science and Industry when they were having the Black Creativity exhibit that once a year juried show for artists across the country, not just in the Chicago area. And that one piece of uh, Alpha's is the fabric piece on that middle wall there that she's sharing with us today. But she introduced me to Adaro when I ran into her at the exhibit and um, 
she's young, <laughs> exciting, uh, lots of energy, and bringing a new perspective. Uh, young people also bring in a lot more technology that you have to figure out, too. As a senior, <laughs> it becomes a thing for me. But uh, I introduce to you both uh, Alpha Bhutan and uh, Adara Knott, and this show called Either Wrong or Right, Just a Match. Thank you. Hello, thank you all so much for coming and joining us today, especially during an event of pandemic. Um, but despite that, we are here. Thank you again just for sharing space. Um, being a part of the inaugural curatorial fellowship with the Edison Art Center was a wonderful opportunity. The opportunity to work with one of my mentors, one of my art mentors, Alpha Chan, was incredible. Um, Really, our artistic envision is held in a generational approach. Um, I'm really passionate about finding mentorship, but also finding truth and validity in my own perspective as well as a younger person. And so with this curatorial fellowship, um, we really wanted to merge the perspectives from someone who's established versus someone who's emerging. And so really we were exploring how artists examine the state of their environment through four themes, such as racism, spirituality, art as wellness, and documentation. So we did art talks where we um, really were able to call, do a call out for diverse artists, um, black, indigenous artists, disabled artists, uh, people of color, women. Um, that was really important for us to be able to uh, put together uh, a, a work that was representative of everyone and inclusive of everyone. And as curators and artists, it's our responsibility to really make sure that the art that we are exhibiting is accessible for everyone. So you'll see that we have caption videos. Um, and so in one of our events that we did with the um, African American tea ceremonies, we had an ASL interpreter. Um, so those things are really, really important. And me as a curator, my, my curatorial practice is centered around accessibility and disability. Um, so with our art talks, we were able to interview and pair an emerging artist with an established artist um, for each theme and really have them really discuss and talk about their work, um, talk about the issues that we deal with, especially with racism, especially with the things that are going on in the past and still are going on today. Um, so I'm just happy that you guys are here to experience this. And Alpha, yeah. Thank you, dear. So Dara said it all, and um, thank you, Fran. Um, thank you, Paula, Kira, and um, for being, all of us have been a part of this, um, this whole year, you know, of documenting this, um, this process. Um, even beginning um, when we started it and we were interviewed, then we went into Zoom, we went into COVID, and we tried to figure out how we were going to program and then program nationally and then take all of this information without coming to the center. You know, um, I did do a lot of community engagement. I was invited to be a judge for the Biennale. Um, and then also with Soul Works, I was a part of the exhibition here with Fran Joy as a curator and uh, Rose Cannon, co-curator. Um, and then I was part of the lecture series uh, where I presented the pop-up research station, which got a lot of press, you know, for Evanston and what we're doing here. And, um, and then recently there is a new program that one of your interns invited me to do a, a blog uh, interview on. We also did 720 minutes of podcasting this whole entire time. We have 24 um, artists from the community, national um, uh, artists that spoke to um, what is curatorial practice, you know? Um, and um, so you will be able to listen to those podcasts. Um, this will be part of the digital footprint of Evanston. Uh, it'll, it'll live on, on the website and also, you know, 
in cyberspace <laughs> somewhere. Um, we were all in the beginning kind of trying to figure out how do we do this Zoom platform? How do we communicate with each other? Um, and then we got the tutorials, we got a little better. Uh, it took a year. Um, my approach with the exhibition and the artists that I personally invited to be a part of this fellowship are four artists that I have long-term relationships with, that we started our curatorial practice together in the 90s. Um, and so um, that's why they were invited, because they, with my trajectory in terms of myself as an artist and a curator, um, they came along with me. You know, they invited, we were all part of our studio practice together. We were all part of Celebration Arts, asked me to be their visual art director um, at 35, you know, and running that program and cur curating and pulling artists from all over the uh, Northern California and the Central Valley together to exhibit. And we were African-American artists, but we're also friends because a lot of other artists decided we want to be a part of what you guys are doing. Um, from Celebration Arts, we moved to the Visual Art Development Project, and then we even hosted an African American Arts Summit in 92 and 94 that was really well attended by artists throughout the state. Um, so with Carol Henry, that was Talver and that was Shona that I was talking about in the text of we started our uh, trajectory as artists and curators together. Well, Carol Henry um, was part of that too. I met her, she was a curator for the African American um, History and Cultural Center in Fort Mason, San Francisco, invited me into an exhibition where Somalia Lewis was the, uh, one of the judges on that big, you know, that big show exhibition. It wasn't a show, it was an exhibition. And she invited me there and we've had this long term friendship and relationship and we've done projects across the country and internationally together. Um, this summer, she's going to be, and she'll talk about that, curating an exhibition in Ghana. And she does a lot of residencies in, in Ghana, but she, will, um, she wanted to be able to show us and televise from Ghana her curatorial work. So she'll include that in her conversation. And uh, Daphne, interesting enough, uh, was invited to uh, an exhibition that I was curating in Fresno, California at the African American History and Cultural Museum of the Central San Joaquin Valley. And she did her first one uh, woman exhibition there at that museum. So we all had these relationships that we've maintained for since the 90s, the early 90s. Uh, um, and, and we're here now. And this, this is why I invited them to be a part of this intergenerational dialogue and be a part of the fellowship. And throughout this time, we've taken the time to examine the state of our environment, you know, either wrong or right, examine. On the exhibition committee, there was a process for Alpha and Adero to be selected. And there was a request that went out after we got the criteria together, and then people submitted their applications for it. And Alpha and Adero were the ones that made the final cut and were the finals that were selected. And we will have an ongoing fellowship next year's will be for uh, Melissa Malatar, who's a South Asian descent. So it's going to be ongoing, and I wanted you to know that. And it has a lot of moving parts because it takes place over like a year's time. I left that out. So thank you. <laughs> Hey, thank you so much, everyone. Um, we will now hear from the artists. Um, I believe Daphne is up first. Okay, hello, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay, I hope? Thumbs up, yes. <laughs> Okay, well, um, I would like to, to thank um, 
um, Alpha, everyone at the um, Evidence Art Center for um, allowing me to participate in this exhibition. Um, I was really intrigued um, when Alpha first mentioned this idea, the curatorial fellowship, that, that idea of fellowship, because even though as an artist, the, the bulk of my career has been really focused on community work and teaching classes and, and doing things outside, well, 30 years almost. Um, so I, as a child growing up and never really seeing anybody who looked like me teaching art or giving back to the community in that way by doing something creative. And so I began with just doing um, art classes here and there, really focused on um, places where there was little access to that type of creative experience and really trying to work with people to bring that to um, children and their families. And so, you know, when you have that kind of desire to create art, but you don't really have that inspiration or see that in someone else to really know that that's something that you can do as well, I think that's really um, heartbreaking in a lot of ways. And so I really tried to be that person for a lot of youth that I kind of interacted with um, early on in my, in my art career. Um, and luckily, and Shona will probably touch on this as well since she and I um, uh, have tag teamed so many of the projects um, that I am um, referring to. It, it was really something for a young person to kind of see their face or see themselves in something that was actually in their community. Um, so that's really been my passion. And, you know, when I do work, I always kind of have that idea in the, in the back of my mind. Um, the works for this particular show, however, really are, I, I think um, the, the transition for me as an artist into a different um, type of, of work and a, and a style. Um, the, the bulk of the work that I was creating up into this um, time frame, so around 2008, 2009, um, was very representational. Um, that's what I grew up doing and drawing. And so after a, a point, I just really started to kind of uh, think of ways where I can put more of myself into my work and doing rep representational images wasn't exactly it for me. I, I knew I could do it, but I, I wanted to push myself to, to do something else, something um, different. And so that's when I really started getting into these um, exaggerated figures and um, personifying musical instruments. And partially because, you know, I was going through some other life changes um, at the time, this transition was really kind of sparked by meeting other African-American artists who I didn't even know existed in the town where I was born and raised. And it was really eye-opening, just like when I first heard about the um, artists of the Harlem Renaissance. You know, it was like, who were these people and why didn't anybody tell me about them when I was younger? Um, it was that kind of like, aha, like, oh my God, I need to know who these people are and where they are so I can be amongst them. And so when I started working in this way, I was also kind of meeting all of these people and having all of these interesting conversations around art and, and um, community. And that's what really sparked my, my interest in um, really exhibiting because most of the work at the time I would paint and it would be in the garage somewhere or you know I, I might have given it to a friend or something thinking that I was, really wasn't going to do anything with it. Um, so having that group of fellow artists to kind of um, be that support system, and in particular African-American artists, because I really wasn't 
uh, up until that time, really um, interacting with many of them because the work that I was doing at the time was not art related. And so um, I felt that I just needed to throw myself, you know, headfirst into this art world. And, and Shona, again, was one of those artists who I credit for kind of showing me th that, that art world that I was really thirsty for, but not really knowing that that's, you know, what um, that desire that I was feeling was. And so with that, I, I created these pieces that, that are in this exhibition and um, have really kind of stuck with that style for the past few years. And I always feel like I kind of transition into other things. So um, I began, a, a, I would say another transition a few years back um, with doing some metal work and, and working with his glass and all those types of things. But um, I, I really feel like this work was a turning point for me in, in a lot of ways. And it's wonderful to um, be able to share them and for me to even kind of think back on some of those issues that I was kind of grappling with as an artist, um, like my self-image and racism and this idea of what is Black art, which can be a whole other conversation um, for um, another day perhaps, but it's, um, it's really nice for me to kind of look back on those times and kind of see where I was and how, even though I feel like I've transitioned into different things over the years, some of those issues and some of those kind of topics, um, unfortunately are still with us and those stories need to be told and the African-American experience needs to be um, told in this visual form. And though oftentimes when people see my work, they don't necessarily think of it as African-American art. But when I look at these pictures like, like these, I see my grandmother sitting in that chair quilting. I see people that I know, and it might not be a representational image of their face, but I feel like you can still capture that spirit, that character, without necessarily having representational image. And to me, that is Black art. Thank you, Daphne. <laughs> Thank you. Now we will hear from Talver. Yes, um, I'm Talver Germany Miller. And I feel like this is a really honor to participate in this exhibition. I wish that I could have sent more work. However, um, sending work can be quite expensive. Um, but again, um, I think that it was important for me to send the work that I'm working on um, presently. And that's, um, working with um, nature, working with um, my feelings and um, expressing what it means to me to really develop an intense observation of our world and because I have an infinity and a closeness, my husband is Jamaican. I spend time in Jamaica and I see a microscope of devastation, but I also see such beauty. And I wanted to present that beauty in my work. 
Also, the beauty that I've experienced growing up in Sacramento, California, as we know, California is incredibly beautiful. Um, and also experiencing the idea of becoming an artist. My first career goal was to be a professional counselor and I have a degree in counseling, but I've always been an artist ever since I was a little girl. And that part of me continued to eat away. So what I decided to do a number of years ago is to retire from counseling. I work for the Las Rios Community College District as well as I still do. I went back to school, back to college, got a degree in art, and decided that I just want to teach part-time art. So that's what I've been doing for the past 10 years. And it's such a wonderful experience because I work with a diverse group of students. Um, we presently have uh, an outreach center in, um, Sacramento um, in Rancho Cordova. Primarily, um, a lot of the students that I work with are African American students, uh, Hispanic, Asian students. And I also um, work in, for Los Rios. We have an outreach center in Placerville, which is, oh, well, I'd say about 45 minutes from Sacramento. And I work primarily with um, Caucasian students. But nevertheless, it doesn't matter what color. The most important thing is to provide that service to the students. And I've also done a number of community services. I've worked with Alpha, I don't know how many years, and Shona, and Carol. And I hope to work with Daphne. And we've done some incredible, wonderful workshops. We've done workshops in Dillon Beach, um, all over Sacramento, other parts of um, the Sacramento Valley, like Stockton, um, Auburn. Um, we've just expanded our horizon. So I'm looking forward to doing much more with Alpha and everyone here. I think that um, as an African-American woman and professor, that we need to continue to produce our work and to grow. Even though I have many years behind me, I'm still experimenting, I'm still learning. And um, I, I think that when I'm, under the ground, that's when I'll stop experimenting. But until then, I hope to, to expand my understanding of composition, observation, um, what it means to develop my values, my shadows, all of those things that are important in developing art and also experimenting with various art mediums. I like to work with watercolor. I think that's part of one of my favorites. But I also like working with acrylic. Acrylic is, it's kind of um, an opportunity to work a, a more uh, kind of um, an idea of you're working in oil, but you're not. So what I've done is I've worked with acrylics, so now I've moved back to oil. And I really enjoy working with oil. So I'm doing um, a number of um, compositions. I've started doing uh, plein air painting. Um, and you know, it's not very often that you see um, African-Americans doing plein air painting. 
but it is it's so incredibly wonderful. And by doing the plein air painting, I can begin to expand and not just looking at it in terms of representational, but looking at it in terms of how can I expand on that? How can I um, develop an abstract from that where I'm just totally abstracting the shapes and the forms and the colors and the placement. So that to me is, um, you can't, I, I can't even express the feeling that I get. And also because I'm out in the environment and the environment is so important. Um, I'm not totally cooped up in, uh, I can say um, a studio. So I can not only develop my work as I'm out in doing the plein air painting, but I could bring it back to the studio and work and also take photographs um, to enhance um, what I'm working with. So um, that's pretty much it. And I'm also, I work with developing jewelry. I like working with um, various metals and found objects. And so that all plays a part in um, my creativity as an artist. So um, again, I'm very proud to participate in this exhibition. And um, so with that, thank you so much. <clears throat> okay, greetings everybody from Clinton, Maryland. <clears throat> I'm Carol Henry Alexander. Happy to be here today and to have been part of this uh, year journey with Alpha and Adero and the other artists here, um, expanding our creativity and imagination together. Um, I wanted to share, I, I want to say to you, this is a wonderful booklet that they've created to document our work. And if you look on page 17, you can get kind of a gist of what's going on with my work over the 40 years of my professional practice. So I want to talk more about the here and now with y'all today. Well, I tell you, I have been an artist, painter, community artist. And uh, in this COVID times, I had a lot of opportunity to really start um, documenting, putting together the documentation of my work and to develop stories that the artwork tells about my life and my journey, the lessons I've learned, the people I've met, et cetera. And in doing that in this last year and a half, I've kind of strayed from the path that I thought I would be on at this point in my life. And the way in which I have um, strayed is that I've brought all the aspects of my life together and now that is what I define as my art. So if you see me today, I work on um, traditional artwork, which you're seeing now um, in the gallery and on the slide. I'm also a, an ardent um, gardener. I have a kitchen garden and I have been studying medicinal plants for the last, since 2013. And uh, so I have a lot of medicinal plants in my garden. Um, and because of that, and just my life in general, I'm very much involved with nature and also work in my community and communities nationally around the fight for 
um, environmental justice. All of those aspects are what these pieces that you're looking at today embody. So if you look at the um, reaching for the mother piece, this piece really um, was created for this exhibition. And it was interesting how it came about because Alpha asked for some um, images and I sent her what I had been working on. And at the time, if you look on the brochure, that image was something that I took pieces of artwork that I had been working on and put it together digitally and made it into a digital artwork. And then when she said she wanted to have that as part of the exhibition, I was challenged to actually create the piece. So it's been interesting to start with silk screening and paper making and sewing and painting on different images and then working out what I was, my vision was on my iPad and then taking that and then coming back to the original pieces of art that I made and putting it all together into that piece. So for me, it's, uh, it's definitely a pivotal piece. Uh, I'm really loving, I really am going to take that image uh, that you're seeing now and work back into it digitally and see where things go with it. So. It's a real give and take and playing and really, really fun. Now the piece on the right, Charm for Asian and African Women Farmers. Um, I do a lot of traveling on the continent, on the African continent, mostly in West Africa and Nigeria and Ghana. And um, I'm always seeing the women in the fields. Everywhere I go, the women are in the fields. And I really um, want to, I call it a charm because I'm, I wanna bring their energy, highlight their energy, their hard work, their love for the land and the plants. Because as a gardener myself, I know people say, oh, you got a green thumb. And I always tell people green thumb is loving the plants, having a relationship with the plants. That's all a green thumb is. And those sisters out there um, in the fields, I wanted to lift up because no farmers, no food, right? So that is really honoring our women farmers. And you can see in there, on both pieces, I, I have a lot of handmade paper and I make the paper from the leftover plant materials from my garden. And also um, in the charm on the right side, I started that when I was in Ghana working with uh, Dinkra printers. And they weave the cloth, they wove that cloth for me. I don't know if y'all have ever seen, they, they weave in four inch strips and then sew the weaving, the woven cloth together to make the yardage. So that's what that is there um, and in Tonso, Ghana, up in the central region. And then the handmade paper and then the painting. So um, getting a little, I guess, complicated and bringing in a lot of different materials and media. But I tell you, it is um, really great fun. And it feels like my practice now that's kind of morphed into this new way of working. It's giving me more excitement and um, you know, joie de vivre. Um, so that's what's happening. Um, like Alpha mentioned, I had planned in 2020 to go to Ghana and work with um, the Office of Tourism there. They have sites that they're trying to develop for their tourist trade, right? And when I was there in 2006, at the Cape Coast Castle, they have a lot of artists who are selling their art outside of the castle in little self-made booths. The art had nothing to do with the castle. It didn't tell the story of the place or the people or the history or the present or vision for the future. 
it was kind of like generic art, you know, a palm tree silhouette on a sunset kind of thing. And I was talking with the, the guy who run the, ran the place and said, oh, I could do, because I do this here in the States, we could do some visioning with the artists and help create a narrative that can reflect in their work here at the castle. And um, spoke with the artists and everyone was really excited about it. And then COVID came. So it, my work has been put off now and I'm hoping to go um, in at the beginning of next year after the rainy season. <laughs> so yeah, um, so my work is pretty influenced by my time in West Africa, which really, I guess I could digress a bit and say that it began when I traveled to Cuba in the 80s for some conferences of visual artists. They called it third world artists. So artists from all over the world. And I learned about Santaria. And I learned that the, the root home place, which is based on nature was in Ife, Nigeria. So I had to go there. And I back and forth to Nigeria over the years, studying their art their culture, and somehow it's got in me, and I feel like the art, um, my art reflects some sort of understanding of where their story of origin comes from. And thus, I can relate as a fellow human of African descent of that origin story. So, you know, that's my thing, back and forth to the continent, working here in the community for environmental justice, um, growing my herbs, sharing my herbal medicine on mutual aid, people who are out in the community working for their own well-being. And um, I'm very happy and proud to be part of the exhibit. Um, I love working with Alpha. It's interesting always. And um, I appreciate all the work she has done towards this project. And I'm so happy to see the fruits of her labor today and look forward to the Evanston community also coming to the gallery and supporting the work that she has done. So with that, I will say thank you um, sisters for the opportunity to work with you all. And I look forward to future possibilities. Oh, I could say carolhenryalexander.com. That's where you can see more stuff about me. Thanks. My turn, huh? <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me here today. I also want to thank uh, Alpha Buton and the Evanston Art Center uh, for inviting me to be a part of this wonderful and amazing uh, exhibit. I tell everyone uh, that um, I came into this world with a paintbrush uh, in my hands. I, I can never uh, not remember as a young girl, one, two, three, and four, five years of age, not doing art. Uh, my art experiences has been inspired by, for the most part, uh, the Black women in my life. My mother, a single Black mother raising um, kids on her own. My grandmother, she raised 10 kids on her own, uh, and to see the strength and the courage that these women had was just so uplifting to me. And I felt the desire and the need to paint that courage and that strength on canvases. So most of my work uh, depicts images of strong Black women. 
um, in the late 80s, I believe when I was about 27, I had the opportunity to go to uh, Germany, Germany for a, a visit. I was able to stay there for one year as a tourist uh, with a friend. And I would say during that time, I had a, a lot of alone time uh, in the apartment by myself, no one to talk to. That's when I really start, started doing art on the level that I had never done before. Painting, um, I was asked to do commission work. I was able to teach art uh, on the Spain Gollum Air Force Base. And when I returned to Sacramento, California, um, I believe that was around in 1989 or 1990, I was asked uh, to be in an art exhibit. Um, I believe it was the um, art, and, um, art Center in Sacramento. And that's when I met this most amazing woman, uh, Alpha Bhutan, and uh, she invited me to come into the circle of artists that she's been, she had been working with for years. Um, we started to do a lot of collaborative work, working with other artists, uh, celebration arts, uh, worked with Calver, um, with the Visual Arts Development Center, and just doing a lot of art exhibitions in Sacramento, um, community work uh, with uh, children, youth, and families. And we all shared a, a exhibit space um, at the um, space where the Zawadi Gallery uh, was housed. And it was at that time, as a young Black female artist, I had the opportunity to meet great artists like Bob Burge and John King and all of these amazing artists that came to visit. And um, I felt at that particular time that I was actually experiencing uh, the Harlem Renaissance right then and there. Um, as Daphne mentioned earlier, um, I had no clue about what uh, the Harlem Renaissance was about, or any of the artists from the Harlem Renaissance was about. But that moment experiencing all the love and, and the connections is what really inspired me to do my research on these artists uh, from the Harlem Renaissance, because some of these artists that I had met had mentioned names to me that I had never heard of. So I started doing research. And like Daphne, I'm like, how can I not have known about these amazing artists? And um, from that moment on, I made it my mission, along with partnering with Daphne to make sure that we were educating the children and the youth and uh, the families and our community about that time period of the Harlem Renaissance, we created programs um, based around the education of the Harlem Renaissance. Little did I know that I was already connected to these artists. I tell people that um, when I would go visit someone's home, they had to hide their magazines because I'm that one, when I find a magazine, I'm just ripping it all apart, you know? <laughs> and I have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of images and folders of amazing artists from S's Magazine, Jet and Ebony and Upscale, and I have them placed in, in folders. So when I started going back through my folders, I realized that most of the artwork that was there in these folders were images of artists uh, from the Harlem Renaissance. I was already connected with these artists and I didn't even know. So that brought me to the understanding of ancestral connections and um, bringing in the spirit of 
the ancestors into my work. Um, I really started studying the works of Charles uh, White, um, Lois Milo Jones, um, and just being able to um, define what the spirit and the connection of the ancestors meant to me as a Black woman um, uplifted my soul and my spirit. And when you look at my work, uh, this one in particular, one is called the African Connections. One is, uh, to, the one to the left is a dedication of uh, Lois Milo Jones. I, when I begin to sit down and think of the subject matter uh, that um, I want to work on, uh, on a particular piece, I always sit down in my quiet uh, mode and I, I think and I, and I meditate about what the connection is going to be uh, between the experiences of the Black woman, um, her energy, um, her strength, her passion, uh, and her pain uh, as it relates to the connection of the ancestors. And that's how I um, connect and uh, work on every piece uh, that I find myself um, putting together. I, I, I go back and I read books. Um, I look at hundreds of images until that spark and that fire is in me to move forward with one particular piece that's going to um, showcase a connection with the ancestors. So I say my relationship is with, with art is like a, a personal connection with the most divine spirit. And I can't begin to do that work. I mean, if it's loud, if it's a, a lot of things going on in the, in the, uh, in my environment, I have to quiet myself down. And I think that today um, as black women, as women period, we have to quiet ourselves down and just listen, listen to the whisper of the ancestors. And that's what I do when I uh, start uh, working on a particular piece. This piece right here is um, matrix Arctic uh, black women. And again, just, speaking to the strength of uh, the Black woman as water barriers and um, head carriers. Um, I, I try to find um, a connection, if I can, between if I have more than one woman, uh, what is that connection uh, between the, the women in a particular piece, a piece that I did recently with Daphne Burgess was a uh, women uh, was a mural actually from women of the Indebelli tribe, and we worked on that mural again, uh, speaking to uh, the ancestors and the healing of um, our community. Because women who paint their homes from the Indebelli tribe, they paint their homes as a sense of pride and dignity and healing for their community. Um, I found, like Daphne, uh, these days I don't get a chance to paint as often as I would like to because I do more community work with children and um, families. Um, I'm the founder of the Sojourner Truth African Heritage Museum in Sacramento. Um, Daphne has been there right by my side, helping me with a lot of this important work that we do to educate the children and youth about the Black experience, in particular about um, public art, about images that they can be proud of, that they can be inspired by. Um, she recently moved <laughs> to Alabama, so I miss her so much, uh, but we're still connected. And um, we're all still connected, Calver and and um, Alpha, and now we, I, I just met Miss Carolyn on the, 
um, Zoom a link here. So just being able to have that connection as Black women continues to empower me and um, again, give me uh, the energy that I need to do uh, to do this very important work to educate um, our community about Black art and the Black experience. Um, and hopefully uh, in the near future, um, I'm hoping that I can have a one woman show. I've never had a one woman show. Um, I'm trying to put some pieces together. I'm trying to find that balance between running a nonprofit um, and doing my own personal works of art. Um, also, um, I find myself uh, doing more uh, mural uh, projects. I mentioned the uh, In the Belly uh, mural that Daphne and I did together. Uh, I also worked on um, a recent mural called um, Having um, Her Seat at the Table. It's an image of a very melanated Black woman uh, sitting at the table uh, with a rose and a vase. And as a Black woman, for me, uh, living in the city of Sacramento, it's, it's been a journey for me to find my seat at the table, uh, experiencing a lot of injustice as a African-American artist, um, not being able to show my work at certain galleries, having particular mural projects shut down uh, due to racism. So I'm continuing uh, to uh, navigate uh, through uh, that system. And um, I'm looking forward to a day here in Sacramento where I can just, as a muralist, just paint the Black experience. And um, I was recently invited to do a mural project and I'm advocating to do just that because it's, it's been, even though Sacramento is like <laughs> the capital here, it's, it's, it's been, like I said, it's been a journey here. And um, I was telling the group that in other cities, like in particular Philadelphia, um, artists, you know, they can paint images of black faces um, on the wall, on murals, uh, just black faces. But it's been a really difficult journey in Sacramento as an artist for me to do that. And I told the group, let me start today. Let me start with this mural, with painting the black experience. So children, so black children in the community um, can see images that look like them so they can be inspired um, by these images. And um, I always think of the painting of Michelle Obama with the young black child looking up at that image because it is life-changing for a child to be able to uh, relate to images that look like them and that inspire them. Um, so that's the work that I've been doing and I'm so excited to be here to, today uh, with all of you amazing um, women and I look forward to uh, continuing to do this work with all of you. And thank you for having me. Um, in 2008, she became the first um, African-American museum in Sacramento. Um, in March, she expanded um, the museum into a um, 3,000 square foot space. Um, and uh, we celebrated that because when we started the, uh, the curatorial fellowship, she was getting ready to envision that and it started off in an empty room and she just had this vision. So all the installations in that museum was, uh, was Shona, you know, painting them and getting things ready for, for the opening. Of uh, during the pandemic, um, Shona fed people. You know, she got a huge grant, for CARES, and um, she was able to give out bags of artwork to families that came to pick up the dinners in front of the museum. Um, the museum is housed in a business incubator, so she's doing this art and placemaking project where art and business uh, merge. 
the owner of the development, he's, he owns a mural collection that Shona and I started. Um, over 2,000 square feet of murals are in that incubator where they have mural tours that come through there. And again, for her to, uh, during this, this time, able to open up into a uh, fully expanded museum in that space, you know, and be the first uh, African-American museum, you know, to open there in Sacramento, you know. And it took her 20 years to get there, and now she's here. You know, and so when she says a seat at the table and balancing life between being a visual artist and that passion that comes with us as an artist, but also to balance that museum practice, you know, that goes into trying to continue that. Uh, Daphne and I work as consultants for her. I do research and development, and Daphne is the, uh, the other grant writer in development for the museum, and we've been doing that during this whole time to raise money and to keep that museum, you know, um, in flow. Um, all of our dollars, and I know I'm supposed to be talking about my art, but this is part of what I do. All the dollars, even the money that the Evanston Arts Center raised for us to do this was aggregated out to other artists. You know, we paid artists to speak. They didn't just come on and talk. Um, they, you know, we gave them a stipend. Whatever we could do to take the monies that we raised for this project and give it to another artist, you know, during the time that they, it could pay a bill. You know, it could do not only lunch, but it could be art supplies that they're purchasing. So we, for California to hear the money and the resources have been shared amongst us, right? That's what we do. And um, so that's why I wanted these four people to be a part of this. Very proud of each of them and where they are in the trajectory in their own life um, and, and their you know, dedication. It just takes so much dedication to do this. Um, the works that I'm presenting, because um, to kind of pull the exhibit together, um, this piece is a textile piece. I do work with only a certain era of, of, of quilting. I don't do contemporary quilts. I do, this is from the G's Bend collection. It's assimilation of the work that the women uh, on that particular plantation did. Um, and you'll see a lot of their work in documentation, but I'm doing this uh, form of 3D quilting. Um, and it's not where I go out and buy the fabric. This fabric is from actual dresses that people, you know, sent me maybe a 12 inch by 12 inch square. And then I took that, those squares and then added them to the uh, project, right? I don't buy a fabric. You have to cut something that you love, that has a history, that has a memory, and send it to me so that I incorporate it into the piece, right? Um, the border, uh, Elaine Lock Charter Academy, one of the schools in Sacramento, they took their first Aon Corporation, big philanthropic, uh, they took one of the small schools to Ghana on their first uh, eighth grade trip. They took them out of the west side to, uh, to Ghana. And they brought me back fabric from the continent, you know, a big roll of fabric. So that's where that, that border came from. So, um, and these pieces are gonna be in Boston in um, this, um, uh, in 2022, they're gonna be exhibited there with, uh, in a collaboration with Renee Baker, which is a composer and I'm a visual artist and we're, we're doing this, this, um, this piece together where she's photographing my work to, and making a composition of music and scores to my visual uh, textile work along with other uh, textile artists that will be in that, that group exhibition in Boston. And the um, other two pieces that I brought in were pieces from uh, during the, uh, we always talk about the pandemic because it's just the year of when we're all on hold. And this piece is redone for um, um, Gallagher Sharp and I worked on them and uh, they were talking about like the silence in, um, just the silence that happened. You know, the, I, I can say it was just, it was just silent, even though it was a lot of noise, but we had to go in within ourselves and be quiet and be still to get through that this past year. Um, and uh, again, Shona talked about Lois Malou Jones, and this is how Shona and I work for some reason. Our, our, our images mirror each other when we work, and I went out to um, Sacramento and did a, a installation on a totem pole focusing on uh, Malou's work 
And I took the band, the, I took on this work, I took the, um, the face mask off. Her eyes were covered on the original work. And I took the work off that we need to see you, I see you, and not behind the mask. And that's what this piece is representing here. Um, and then the other piece is just, again, a be still. And it's looking at the existence. I can't really pronounce that word. It's like existence. And, you know, and that, what is that? You know, and we, that's a, something we had to explore as artists that were invited into that exhibit in their gallery show. Um, and so I'm, I'm saying that to say, and we're going to kind of wrap everything up, is that when you form relationships with people in the arts, you maintain those relationships and you nurture those relationships. And all of the conversations that we've had during this, you know, curatorial practice are very important. You know, they'll remain as a footprint. You know, um, I got a chance to meet three artists that I hadn't met before um that were part of the dialogue and the art talks the other artists we had cross intersections of relationships with over the last decades or so um being here in in uh, chicago and they are listed in the catalog um during the rest of the exhibition um we will have uh we went through art and wellness we went through documentation and then the next series of um of videos are going to be on racism and then spirituality, and they will be played once a week uh, during the day, and then uh, they'll also land on the website uh, with the Edison Arts Center. So again, thank you all for coming, and then I'm just kind of kind of wrap it up. We do have refreshments for you. Um, you need to just put them in a bag to go, and uh, thank you guys for coming out.